Thank you for downloading Season 5, Episode 7 of The Fix, the podcast that keeps baseball pitchers healthy and effective. I am your host, Joe Janish, and with me, as always, is baseball pitching motion expert, Angel Borelli. Angel, how are we doing today? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing just great. It's uh, early July, and it's starting to heat up here on the East Coast. I can't imagine how it how it is over there on the left coast. Is it uh, is it warming up over there as well? <laughs> yes, it's uh, actually staying warm. <laughs> so yes, we have beautiful weather here and it's a beautiful time for baseball. Great. So, um, so today we have a few different things we're going to be talking about. First thing I want to do is we're going to start out with our lessons from MLB. I'm a big time baseball fan and New York baseball fan. So I'm always paying attention to what's happening with the New York Yankees. And it turns out that our oldest Chapman is dealing with a knee tendonitis this year, and it's it's left knee tendonitis, and he's been kind of held back a little bit. It, they're going to try and keep him off the disabled list, but they're they're concerned about his left knee. And I remember I, I was listening or I was reading somewhere that the, the concern with our oldest is that because it's his left knee, and he being a left-handed pitcher, they're concerned that it's going to affect his velocity because the left leg is his push-off leg. Now, you know, even if you haven't been listening to our our podcast here for the last five years and know a little bit more about how the legs work, one thing that kind of struck me by that comment was the fact that just about a week ago, Aroldis was throwing 102, 103 miles an hour. So it didn't seem like whatever pain he was having in the left knee was affecting his velocity. So I said, you know what, this might be a good time to bring up the role of the left leg or the right leg, depending on whether you're left-handed or right-handed pitcher, but again, essentially what a lot of coaches and pitchers refer to as the push-off leg or the leg, the foot that the leg that is connected to the rubber when they take their stride. So, Angel, could you tell us how Aroldis Chapman's left knee could be affecting him and his pitching? Okay, well, let's talk about Araldis first, and then I want to talk uh, talk about does the pitcher, should the pitcher push off the rubber. So first of all, he's got an injury to his uh, left leg, and he is a left-handed pitcher, so his left leg will be his rear leg. It's also the only leg that's on the ground as he's moving from his left leg onto his landing leg. So during the part of the motion where he is taking his right leg and reaching it out into the stride before foot plant, the only leg that's on the ground is his left leg. So it is an important leg. So yes, everyone should be concerned. Uh, Number two, the leg itself, its role is of course to keep you, you're on one leg, you know, when you're at the top of your knee lift, and then that foot stays connected to the ground so that the hip, his left hip, can move his center of mass forward. There's no other body part that can move his center of mass forward. The hip has to do it, and the foot is staying connected to the ground to let him do it. So in his case, and a lot of pitchers have very bad ankle action and very bad knee action when they're going into their stride. Araldis Chapman has one of the best rear legs I've ever seen. He doesn't rotate the knee, which doesn't have a rotational component. So when pitchers rotate that knee inward, it's really the hip. He keeps the, the out that leg in the most perfect shape. But because Araldis has a stride where he does pitch from behind his front leg, and he also has the wonderful mechanics of keeping his rear foot down at the time of release. It comes up just after ball release. So he's totally stable in this wonderful position, which obviously when you're throwing that hard, you have to be stable. What he does is because of his long front leg and pitching behind it, and also because he has taken that rear leg and turned it and just done a beautiful job, he actually, during delivery, over-rotates his rear leg, and that probably is where the stress is coming in through his knee. He does not have improper knee mechanics during his stride, which is what I went to look for when I heard about this injury. He actually has some improper hip mechanics at the finish that with the foot being down and pressing into the ground, 
which I'll explain more in a second when we talk about pushing off the rubber, it's probably causing a little bit of stress. It would be like if you started walking, we'll call it pigeon-toed. If you walked pigeon-toed for a whole block, and let's say you did it with just one leg, your knee's going to get sore. Now, the knee joint itself may not be becoming compromised, but the muscles that go around the knee, which help keep the knee moving straight ahead, they're all getting tweaked because the knee doesn't have that kind of mobility. So when you see a hip and a foot that's over-rotating and his back foot ends up being sort of pigeon-toed, and that does come from the hip action, when he's doing that at ball release and into the follow-through, it's probably putting some stress around the structures. Now, I did read that he is, you know, he said it, it, it talks to him a lot, but on this particular day, it was worse than usual. So yes, he has this going on. He's had it going on. But again, when you're trying to fix somebody at that, uh, at that level, when you're working with someone who's really good and they're really performing, what you're looking for is that tiny little thing that is causing the problem. And that's where his issue, and that is what, what needs to get looked at. And with the proper person doing the adjusting, it will make him better. Here, here's why he'll be better. <laughs> he won't be distracted by pain. It's not going to change his delivery at all. But the issue of pushing off the rubber, which I love this brings up, is that he has a perfect stride. And obviously, somebody who's throwing that hard, you pretty much know he's doing a lot of things right. But the pushing off the rubber concept, first of all, I think those words came from a pitcher who probably was trying to explain to someone what he feels. You don't really want to have a pitcher telling you what he feels because if he's really good at what he does, he kind of can feel it, but he doesn't really have the language to say it in a way that maybe is accurate, but it's accurate to him but it can t send the wrong message. And you don't want to push off the rubber because if you push off the rubber, first of all, you can't go forward if you're only pushing with the foot. The foot stays connected to the ground. And by the way, it's with about 30% of the body weight because I did this research when I was in graduate school. The, 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 the contact with the ground, the force is in the ground steady so the hip, the pelvis can move sideways using the muscles that are designed to do that, which are hip muscles. So the foot stays connected so the floor above it can move sideways. Now that stability has to stay there so you can move sideways. If you don't believe me, stand on one leg and don't let your hip move off that leg and see if you can go sideways. Your front leg can't pull you you have to move the pelvis, the rear side of the pelvis. So you don't push off because if you push, you're getting some too much force going forward. And what it does is it causes the lower body to get so far ahead that the upper body then can't really, is really struggling for the rest of the motion to get in sync. And you usually have a pitcher who looks like he's lunging forward. So his center of his trunk will be way forward. His, his leg is pulled very long, but his upper body has moved too far forward. And then, of course, if you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about then you've got rotation that's off. Then you've got a trunk tilt that doesn't occur at the right time. You're going to have a pitcher who's going to have, number one, inconsistency. And number two, he's going to end up having some sort of problem with increasing his velocity or his arm could get sore because he his timing will be uh, adulterated because of the fact that he's thinking he's got to push hard and that that's where the force is coming from. So his brain is thinking he's got to race down the hill. And of course, that's not what we do. So the a whole thing about the rear foot the rear foot actually goes through what we call ankle extension. It lifts the heel, it goes into the ball of the foot, and then the ball of the foot is secure and it turns. And then it acts as a stabilizer as the pitcher starting to face the plate to release the ball. So if you're pushing too hard, that foot's going to come off the ground because you're literally pushing the ground away. You don't want to push the ground away. You want to stay in contact with the ground so the hips can move. 
And I know that sounds crazy, but for you scientists out there, I know I have physical therapists that listen and people with backgrounds. Your hip AB doctors are what's moving the pelvis sideways. It can't do that if the foot is not correct connected to the ground. It's what we call in science a fixed foot. The foot has to be fixed so the abductor can act in that way. Uh, so that's actually what's happening. So you do not want to talk or teach pushing off the rubber. You're not going to get more power by pushing off the rubber. You will interrupt your power development by quote-unquote pushing off the rubber. Stay in contact with the rubber. Keep the foot in contact with the ground to allow the hips to move sideways efficiently. All right. You know, I'm thinking about this in my head as you're, as you're talking about it. It really sounds like the, the rear leg or rear foot is more like an anchor than anything else. But mm, That's a great word to use. I've never used that word. But yes, it's an anchor. And it's an anchor when you turn and the back leg is down and the trunk is starting to tilt forward. And that's a great word, Joe. Well, I am something of a wordsmith after all. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, anchor. Great. Let's start a whole new trend because see, everybody kind of can get that. I love that. See, when you say things, no pitcher, pitchers who even say push off the rubber, they would agree with what I'm saying that you're not speedy down the hill. They just don't realize it in the language of teaching motion. Words can be we have to use very specific words because we've got to make sure that if I say it to 100 people, 100 people hear the same thing. That's why we have our own language that we explain to each other when as professionals. So anyway, so I think uh, Anchor is a great new way to talk about that. Yes. Well, thank you. And I honestly, I really think as a coach who's coached a lot of pitchers at all different ages, really, I would just stay away from talking too much about the rear leg, you know, like you said, we don't want to teach pushing off. Let the let the pitcher do his stride and not think about it really. As far as not not let him think about the back leg, just kind of let it happen naturally. And if for some reason there's something incorrect about the back leg or the back foot, as we've seen with the oldest Chapman, then go in and have him, you know, think about it. But I feel like the the back leg, there shouldn't be too much thought. I think there's like other things that the pitcher could be thinking about. Well, I think that pitchers are always looking for how do I get the force going? How do I get velocity? And they are always looking for that thing that makes them feel like they're putting in extra effort to create the velocity. I had a pitcher the other day ask me if he lifted his knee higher, would he have more velocity? He actually wanted to know if the knee lifting higher would create a, a ball that comes out of his hand with uh, uh, with an increased velocity and acceleration component. And I really understood what he was saying because he's thinking the higher you go, then you can do something with the rear leg. So everybody's always looking for that little thing about where is power created from. And unfortunately, unless you go to school and understand it, it's hard for lay people to explain that. And a lot of people do think it does come from the back leg because they know it's important. But what it's important about is that, again, it's the only leg on the ground. And if you've only got one leg on the ground, you want to make sure you're handling it correctly. But if you also think it's supposed to do something fancy, that's the leg you're going to look at because it's the only one that's on the ground. It's as simple as that. So yeah, it's easy to understand these myths. Yeah, I always think stay in your lane when you're talking about mechanics. If you don't know exactly what's happening, be careful about using words to describe it. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting you bring up the the pitcher who was talking about his his knee lift because that's something that a lot of pitchers for years have been thinking in. It was a concept really espoused by Tom House to a you know a generation of pitching coaches and pitchers was, was that you know the higher your your knee lift is the faster you're going to be able to pitch because it's it's all about starting up high and moving downhill but you know we we've, we've learned and, and moved far beyond that and uh t toward that end well, before you leave that topic, Joe, not to interrupt, but I want to say this. Here's where a coach, know, you know how I always say, and coaches, you've heard me say this a hundred times, you know what you're seeing and you kind of know what's going on, but unless you have a huge background, you interpret it differently. If you lift the knee higher you are probably going to be more in the right leg. Let's say you're a right-handed pitcher. 
if you lift the knee higher, I'm not saying you should lift it higher, but we want the back leg to be loaded. If someone who can't load his back leg all of a sudden lifts his knee so high that his body immediately moves his center of mass into that one leg that's on the ground, now you've got a greater load. And the greater the load, the better the stride will be from the hip. So he's cor- so you can go a long way around and see how does someone think that a higher knee lift could give them more power? Well, it's giving them more correct weight load into the back hip, which is the reason why pitchers lift their leg to shift into the one single leg. But because people don't really understand that, so they see A and they think, oh, it must be B. So I can see why Tom House and people without background, you know, specific background might go, oh, wow, the higher I lift my leg, the more, uh, you know, my stride feels better. Well, they load it better. And if your knee lift is high and it works, great. But you need to learn how to load the back hip no matter what your knee is doing. So you see what I'm saying, Joe? It's so easy to see something and I can make sense. I always know what a coach is thinking. Yeah. But he's not saying all the pieces together. But that thanks for bringing that up because, yes, he is somebody highly respected and he does have thoughts. I mean, he does see what's going on. Sometimes the explanation isn't uh, always, uh, you know, maybe coming out the way that we would want it to. Well, I think that, it actually, what you're talking about with loading the leg, it's it's seen in hitting as well. I mean, I've definitely seen hitters who would kick up their front leg for their stride. And and Sadaharu O oh from Japan, the the greatest home run hitter of all time, you know, he lifted up his front leg really high. And and I think people thought, oh, you lift up your your front leg and that gives you power. Well, it's because it's not because you're lifting up your front leg. It's because he did that to load up his back leg, and it's it's the same concept. So. Interesting. Very interesting parallel there. All right. So let's move into the teaching moment because we have a very interesting topic that um, you're going to give us five different tips to think differently about about pitching today. And and I just want to give some background to the readers. There's going to be a link in the show notes to an article that I was reading fairly recently. And it was it was about a there were a number of different really, really good major league pitchers mentioned in this article. And they were talking about a lot of different things about pitching specifically. A lot of it had to do with the pain of pitching. And, you know, so, some of the things that, that were said, I just, I just want to mention a couple. I'll kind of like uh, talk about the quotes a little bit. Uh, one catcher was talking about one of his pitchers that he caught for 10 years. And he said that this pitcher was hurt all the time and, Nobody knew what he went through, and but he watched his face for 10 years, and he, he, he didn't think he ever threw a pitch that didn't hurt. And then um, there was another pitcher who was mentioned who said that, you know, pitching is a totally unnatural motion, and uh, it's a hazard just to be throwing. And, and then there's a, there was another quote from another pitcher, tremendous pitcher, who said, there's only one cure for what's wrong with all of us pitchers. He said, that's to take a year off. And there was another quote that went, The way young pitchers are treated is brutal, practically a scandal. Give them a little rest and get them back out there is the common theory when they have an injury. And really that the greatest debate in baseball for the century has been how to care and feed a pitching arm. No question approaches that one in in importance to any team. And then there was some other topics about running and how pitchers need to run because they have to build up their, their lower body. Uh, because pitching is all about the legs, and there were a lot of other different things in in the article. And I'm going to put it. I'm going to put a link in the show notes to it because it's a really interesting article. And the one really interesting thing about this article, I mean, it could have been written two days ago, two weeks ago, but it actually was written 40 years ago, almost to the day that we're recording. It was written in in July 2nd, 1978, and some of the pitchers that were mentioned were Tom Seaver, Jim Lonborg, Jim Palmer. Johnny Sane, Catfish Hunter, Mark Fidrich, Frank Tanana. There was there was a there was a thing in there about when Frank Tanana and Dennis Eckersley were young young fireballers, and they said that their speed had abandoned them by the age of twenty five, and now they're learning to be more crafty. It, and I was just, I was looking at this article, and I was thinking, my goodness, like in forty years, there were a lot of things that pitchers thought 
that they still think today. Now, I I can I can kind of forgive you know the Tom Seavers and the and the Frank Tananas and everybody from from forty years ago because we didn't have the science that we have today. But I I sent this article to you, Angel, and I wanted you to take a look at it. And I think at first you didn't even realize it was written forty years ago, did you? No, that's correct. I actually thought it was current because I do still hear these things, especially from pitchers I know that are current pitching coaches. They're uh, grown men. They have not pitched in decades, but they said, yes, it is assumed that pain is part of pitching. Yeah. So so we talked about this before we, before we came on the show here, and I, you digested it all. And after going through it, you have five ways that pitchers and pitching coaches can now think the new way. And why don't you start to tell us some of the different ways that pitchers can get into the modern age for for lack of a better term? Okay, so there's two things that I want to say about the fact that this article, what this article is saying. There's two things that I hear all the time from the older pitchers. We never had we never did all the stuff that pitchers are doing today. We didn't have pitch counts or anything and nobody was ever hurt. Why are there so many injuries now? Okay, so what this article dispels is the fact that nobody was ever hurt. Because I believe these guys. The, uh, people, you should read the article. It's amazing. And the guys mentioned in there are highly respected. So there, it, this dispels the myth that why all of a sudden are pitchers getting injured? No, all of a sudden we know how to take care of it. Just like all of a sudden we know how to lower cholesterol. All of a sudden we know how to beat heart disease. All of a sudden we want to be healthy. Things change. So so it is not that they didn't used to get injured. They pitched through pain. Okay, that's number one thing I love about this article. The other thing about the article is, is that it is so important to respect all these guys that pitched years ago. Every one of the guys that talks to me about it and says, Angel, we thought it was part of the job. I have the greatest respect for them. And the thing is, is that when you hear the Tom Seavers and you hear the older pitchers and you hear them talking about this kind of thing, or you hear them say something, like I hear pitchers say all the time, pitching's an unnatural motion. If it was unnatural, it wouldn't be a motion. But if you do it incorrectly, you can start just like I was mentioning with the knee. Most pitchers do something very weird with their knee when they're coming off their back leg, something the knee is not designed to do. So if you do that, then we could say, yes, it's unnatural. No, it's not unnatural. You're doing it unnaturally. So the myth of it's unnatural, I mean, why would you let your kid pitch if somebody said, oh, by the way, this is not natural? No, it is natural and it's got an efficiency to it. And somebody who does the work I do, my job is to teach efficiency. I am the English teacher that's going to teach you the alphabet and perfect grammar. Now, if you want to go and text and use acronyms and bust up the English language after you get a lesson in English, cool. But I am the English teacher that teaches how to do it correctly. And that's an analogy. My job is to teach the efficiency of it. So if you add bells and whistles, you do end up... Uh, adding it to something that at least you have the basic knowledge about. So the deal is, is that we want to respect these guys, but the harm is that because we respect them, because we know they're smart, because of their records, we think that what comes out of their mouth has to be true. So yes, they say pitching, uh, you, you ha- you're always going to be in pain. You have to run for the ice. Uh, one of the coaches in the article said all pitchers were either hypochondriacs or fools. I mean, think about that. I mean, when I read that, I went, wow. But these guys, this is the way they were then, but it is not what's going on now. But the threat is, is because the geniuses of baseball were the one, are the ones speaking it. And one of the things we love about baseball is it's so traditional. I never want to see the tradition end. But along with the tradition can come traditional thinking and thoughts that aren't always accurate. So we want to bring that kind of thing 
to the current forefront. And so I want to talk about five things that we can do right now to dispel some of what was written in that article. And listen, I've read articles recently that said the same things. And also, I know all of you guys and all of you pitchers are out, are out there talking to the same people I talk to, and you're hearing them say, oh, it's just, you know, there's no way around it. You're always hurting. And what I am scared about with that is that that might mean that when someone has pain, they just go, oh, and then they don't think twice about it. So I want to talk about five things that are so current that can bring your thinking into the now and also ways for you to look at, well, why now these guys, they were in so much pain all the time and they believe it's part of it. It's turning out they were in pain. So why, uh, why shouldn't we believe them? So let's talk about five things right now that you can do to make sure that you're staying current. Number one, and I'll contrast this with 1978. And by the way, in 1994, when my first pitcher was referred to me and I was a strength coach and I was starting graduate school, the passion you're hearing in my voice now is because when I read this article, I was reminded of why I do this work. These poor guys didn't have anybody on their side saying, let me help you. Somebody who maybe wasn't involved that had a different way to look at things. And being a female who never pitched, being a student of movement and being a scientist, and then just somehow being so attracted to the pitching motion, I made it my life's mission to help you guys, to be that person that offers the information to help you not be in pain. And so I'm very passionate about this topic. So number one, did you ever... Could you ever, for you guys that are older, did you ever see a pitcher go out to the field and warm up his arm? No. Muscles need to be warmed up. So if you are in a if you are a 2018 baseball pitcher and you go out to the field, you put on your cleats and you take a ball and go out and throw it and you haven't properly warmed up your arm, you are a 1978 pitcher. It is insane not to warm up your arm. There's too many great programs out there to do that. Number two. Angel, know, just yes. stop for a second. Okay. When you, say, when you say warm up the arm, you mean something other than take the ball and throw it easily back and forth with, a, with your partner. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm talking about warming up each joint for movement, taking a resistance band, going to the fence, and preparing the body to, do, to preparing the joints and the muscles so they then can do the action. The real, the real preparation comes from the throwing itself, but the preparation of the joints has to be specific and has to have not involve throwing. It's too much too soon. Ask any pitcher who doesn't warm up, and he can tell you the first few throws don't feel good. And it's why the first thing out of the gate that I designed as a in this field, my very first product was my first pitch strike up warm up product because uh, I I knew right away this was a problem. And when I started giving guys this, the feedback I was getting was huge. And it, why it's why it became a product. It was around for three four years before I ever even put it on the market. So yes, warming up and preparing the arm to throw. Don't use throwing to prepare your arm to throw. Number two, we know that the forces you're generating are huge. You've got to get in the gym and train. In that article, they talk about the importance of lower body. You have to have a strong body to pitch. You have to be able to decelerate. You have to be able to hold arm angles. You have to be able to repeat performances. And all of this is being done by your muscles. Do you, I mean, the muscles are like the tires on your car. They have to be aligned. They have to be new. They can't be worn out. They can't have holes in them. You can't have one that has less air than the other. The whole car will not drive correctly if something's wrong with your tires. So you want to think of your muscles as the tires and there's joints that, uh, that the muscles cross. So you have got to strengthen them. So training in 1978, pitchers didn't train. In 1994, they didn't train because I, as a strength coach, 
when I started training people, the coaches were like, what? And I did have one very innovative coach who said to me, take my team. I love what you're saying. And I brought them into the gym in 1995 as an experiment, as a student. And that's how it all began. And believe me, people were going, what? He's lifting a weight over his head? And I'm like, duh, he throws over his head, right? (laughs) So to me, I'm not making the connection. But of course, I have grown up in baseball where people are going, don't put weight over your head. So, it, it, you know, to me, the again, the innocence of being a neophyte, you just, you know, you do what you know is the best thing. And it turned out, of course, to be great. So train. If you are a current pitcher in 2018, you should be lifting weights. If you're not, you're back in 1978. The third thing, believe in what your body is telling you. If your body is speaking to you, if your pitching arm doesn't feel like your other arm, then something's going on. Believe in the fact that it is talking to you. Now, if you can get the belief thing going, then the rest of the steps will be easy. You've got to start to understand that every part of your body wants to do things correctly. It loves when it pops out of bed in the morning and you're not hurting anywhere. You know how happy you are? Well, your body's happy too. When any part of it starts shouting out to you, you need to listen to it and you need to believe that its language is specific. It starts with a little whisper and it'll end up It'll end up with a loud, loud voice if you don't pay attention. Believe what you're feeling. Trust in the fact that it's telling you something important. Now, if you do that, then you can start to believe that it is important for you to be very on top of early detection. And so the minute that you have that early detection thing in you, you go, wait, this is hurting. This wasn't hurting yesterday. Wait a minute. My pitching arm, the back of the shoulder, it, it's usually recovered in two days and now it's been a week. That is something that can cause problems if you don't pay attention to it. So believe in your body's language. And if you believe, then I want you to trust in the efficiency of mechanics and trust that if you work with the right people, they're not going to take away from you what the gift is that you actually have. So you've got to believe in your body and then you've got to trust in the science of adjustments of motion. And that when people work with you who are trying to get you to do something in a little more healthy way, like this little thing with um, Araldus, you think he wouldn't love to know, uh, whoa, I'm just, it's just this tiny little turning thing. In fact, he would be excited to know. And it has n- it's going to have nothing to do with his delivery or his performance, but he's being distracted by it now. I can bet you that. And that's why he pulled himself out of the game because it's he couldn't uh, get past it. So believe in adjustments. And guess what? Pitchers have been making adjustments on their own forever. They don't talk about it, but they do it. They just don't know what they're doing. I'm, I hear every week, I was trying to make all these adjustments because I was doing this or that. And they'll tell me, and I wonder what were they actually trying to adjust because they don't know how to make the connection. So believe in the efficiency of mechanics. And the last thing is, and this is the 2018 thing, don't stop until you get answers to what's going on with you. There is an answer for everything. And it might not be something you like. It may be that you've torn something so badly, but don't stop until you get the information you need to explain, why do I have this pain? How bad is the injury? What is the cause of it? And how can I change and adjust so that this thing starts to heal? It won't heal if you keep doing the same things over and over again. Don't stop until you get the answers. Don't let yourself be pushed away from pitching. Walk away when you're ready and when you're in control. And those five things are what will keep you in 2018 and not way back in 1978. Angel, that's great. Um, That last point of 
don't stop until you find an answer. That's something that really, really is important. I used to be in IT and computer repair, and it was something that we always said, like, if something's wrong with the computer, like, there's, you can always find the answer. There's a reason why something's not working. It's, it doesn't just, like, go bad or something doesn't just happen. Like, there's something that caused it. And I think it's so important for pitchers to find out exactly why they have the pain that they have and not accept an answer like, well, you're a pitcher, so it's expected, or pitching is an unnatural motion. And if you hear that from, even if you hear it from a surgeon or somebody who's a very exactly. uh, highly respected doctor, mm-hmm. whoever it is, run, run, run away, go in the other direction, find someone who will give you the answer that you need, not a, a <laughs> cop out or or a dismissive well you're a pitcher and that's what happens that that's nonsense there there's a reason that the that you're having pain and you need to find out the root cause mm-hmm. and without the root cause you you're just going to hurt yourself again and i think it's so important for yes. people to understand that yes and now when you hear somebody say something and it matches some of the uh, myths in this article or some of the things you can in your head say okay thank you and in your head say 1978 there it is but I'm in 2018. That's what you want to do. You either can operate from thinking from, that's 40 years old or you can be in the now. Right. So speaking of being in the now, we are going to be moving into the ninth inning. And this ninth inning, I am posing uh, some questions to you. And it does have to do with being in the now 40 years later because I happen to be part of a bunch of different Facebook groups. Where, which uh, where the groups are for baseball coaches and baseball parents. And it's most of them are generally mostly parents and coaches just trying to like bounce ideas off each other and trying to share ideas and things like that. And uh, every once in a while, actually every single day, some parent posts a video of their child. In some cases, the child is as young as five or six years old, which makes me crazy, but that's a whole nother can of worms. Um, and they'll show like maybe how, you know, the, the, the pitcher's throwing, like maybe they'll have a side shot of and a video and maybe even a slow motion video. And they'll say, hey, how does he look? Or what can he do to be better? And this is sent out, you know, this is posted to a group and there could be, you know, 300, 500, 1,000 members of the group. And, and in turn, the video post will get maybe... 10 responses, 20 responses, 30 responses, 50 responses, 100 responses. And all of these responses are basically from other other coaches and or parents who take a look and then give their critique or give their advice or, you know, try to provide some kind of, uh, you know, uh, direction on what could be done next. And I watch these things and it, and it makes me crazy because a lot of these people really like you said before, are not staying in their lane. They're kind of getting out of their lane and talking about things that they shouldn't be talking about. And then I feel bad for the the original parent who posted the video because they're just, they're genuinely looking for advice. They think that they're asking the right people the questions. But in fact, I would, it, it seems like maybe they're going to be in even worse trouble than before they posted the video. And I wanted to just bring that up to you and say, you know, what, what should parents be doing instead of posting videos on Facebook and and asking a a large group of people who don't really have the right background for a lot of these things? What, what, what could we do to kind of like help these parents and these, these coaches get, get better advice? Well, first of all, it's interesting because I do, I look at video uh, for a living. Uh, I use video as a tool so that I know where to, how to work with a picture. And I have people come up to me all the time and say, Hey, look at the video of my son. Or they'll call me and say, can I send send a video? And then you just tell me what you think. My answer is always no. Or if it's someone who shoves a face, a, a phone up in my face, like, Hey, look at my son. I go, Oh, wow. He's really cute. And how old is he? I never critique the mechanics because you can't render an opinion on something unless you're going full blown into uh, the analysis of what's happening. So number one, uh, asking for curbstone consultations from a professional 
is risky for the professional to step into that. But it's also kind of crazy for, I think, uh, a parent to want to have their child kind of viewed in a public manner. I mean, I uh, and Joe, you know this because we've worked together so long. You know the objection I have to, that's why you don't hear me critiquing, why we don't critique pitchers on this show, like, oh, he's so bad or he's doing this. We always will sometimes talk about one little thing, but it's in with respect to the pitcher and to what he brings. For example, with Araldis, what he brings to the table is amazing. And this little tidbit isn't a quote unquote critique. Oh, look at his back leg. But unfortunately, it always comes out like that. And having a pitcher be chopped up into pieces of meat like that, I would never be, um, um, I would never put up pitchers mechanics and draw lines and say they're doing this, this and that wrong. Plus, uh, it, 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 movement is interesting. An error that you see is created by something else that has nothing to do with the error that you see. So when you're doing a critique of what you see, you're doing nothing to solve the problem. And so I have a high respect for all pitchers. I don't care if they're six years old. So I don't like the idea of um, going online and asking what does someone think, especially knowing that one, you probably don't know enough to know if that person is speaking the truth. Um, That's the main thing. If you're in search of information, which I completely can understand, You need to know that unless you're going to get an answer or educated so that you are informed enough to know if what that person is saying is correct, you could hear a hundred different things. And I'm sure, Joe, am I right? All those hundreds of responses, are they all different? Uh, In most cases, yeah, they (laughs) they usually are. Exactly. And usually people don't say good things about a pitcher because unfortunately, people who like to do this sometimes want to say it. I mean, I have people call me and I, and, or they'll talk to me. And after about 10 minutes, I'm realizing that this person wants me to know how much they know about pitching. And I feel bad for them because they're talking and they, they want me to know how much they know about pitching, but I'm not sitting back wondering how much they know. I don't expect anybody to know what I know. And I don't try to know what they know. We know what we know. We are what we are. And we all have certain skills and jobs. And my job is of something completely separate than maybe a pitching coach. So I don't sit around going, oh, he's good or he's bad. Everybody's bringing something to the table or they wouldn't be at the table. Because you can't last if you're that bad. So I think that it's a, a problematic for me uh, I, I, on both ends. I don't want to see people talking about things they shouldn't be talking about. Plus, you can't make an evaluation unless you see all four sides. I have do- been doing it long enough to where I can infer something. But even then, I don't, you know, and if I say, hmm, uh, I can see what's happening here. That's because they've sent something. I'm saying, yes, okay. Yes, you sh- you can be my client. Yes, I can help him. Now let's do it the real way. And I didn't get paid for that. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I think I see what he's doing. That's a okay. Well, listen. Send me one video so I can just see. Because for example, I don't work with sidearm pitchers, so I have to kind of see is he a sidearm? Because I don't want the kid coming out and I say I can't work with you because it's a completely different motion. So if I'm going, hmm, yeah, I see what's going on. I don't, I limit it to that. I don't go any further and they're not paying for that. But once you are my client, you're going to get full analysis because it can be damaging. So on the end of those that are doing it, I think you have to be careful. On the end of the parents, you don't want uh, somebody to try, you don't want to have, just like I said last week, don't have your son emulate another pitcher. As much as I love Araldis Chapman, I I can't teach his front leg mechanics because they're not efficient. And so it's 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 not efficient in terms of teaching the way I do. If I said copy him, I would be having you copy something that he has perfected. People, pitchers, there are great pitchers out there that don't do something efficiently. And it's not that, oh, so it's okay to do that. No, they have practiced that and become an expert at doing that. So, you know, you're not going to fault them for that. 
But to teach that out of the gate, when you have the opportunity to teach something that in the end is going to be more efficient, if you're a teacher of motion, that's the direction you go. You don't say, well, you want to throw hard, let's let's use Chapman, let's follow his mechanics. No, you should have a knowledge of, hey, let's build it the efficient way and let's see what happens with that. If you're starting from the beginning and you have that choice, that's what you need to do. So you don't want to be copying someone who happens to have perfected something that works for them. So asking for opinions, uh, looking at them next to um, you know, some other pitcher can be really problematic. Let's have respect for our pitcher. So to all you parents that are asking those questions, ask them of people who have your son standing in front of them because the, you're getting information about that pitcher. If a pitcher walks up to me and let's say he's 12 and he's like I was mentioning earlier, let's say he's pigeon toed, both feet are turning inward. And maybe he's a kid who had braces when he was a baby. Well, when he walks up to me and I see that, that gives me huge information. So when I watch him play catch, or I see, uh, film him and see the video, I already know that he has something going on with his hips so that I'm going to be looking at him in a different way. So parents, don't use video, use human beings, number one. Parents, please put your cameras away. I study video for a living, and I can tell you, it's not easy to know what you're looking at. And so have it to collect it for a memory, not for feedback to your son and not to use maybe to have someone else give you an opinion. Let people, let the professionals do it. There's many great coaches out there and let them do it with your son in front of them, not one shot on a video. And for coaches that do this, I don't know what to say. The Here's what I know. There isn't a coach out there that wakes up and says, I want to hurt some kid today. And there's not a coach out there that doesn't love what they do and want to help. But I would love to see coaches seeking information that helps us spread the word of giving respect to pitchers and making sure that we never use words that can be interpreted in another way. And coaches tell them come and see you, not just use the video. And that's, that's what I would say. And that's how I feel about all of those forums. Yeah. Thanks. And you know, again, this is one of the modern things that we have technology is the ability to share our ideas on the internet very easily. And it's in many ways, it's, it's an outstanding, amazing thing that we have for the human race. And in other ways, it's just, it could actually be dangerous because if you're getting the wrong information from the wrong people, yeah. You know, it's it not going to be good. I, you know, I think about it like if you're a person who's overweight and you want to lose weight and be healthier, I mean, are you going to go on Facebook and go to some group and say, hey, um, here's a picture of me. How do I get skinnier? Like, no, you're, you're going to go to a doctor and a nutritionist and people who can help you and, and you know, help you build an exercise program and a diet and everything else. Yeah. You're not going to look for, you know, help from a, a you know, a bunch of strangers on, on the internet. Yeah. Or if you have a car that isn't running right, you're not going to take a video of the car and drive it and, and say, okay, like, what's that? What's that noise? No, the people are going to say, we'll take it to a mechanic. <laughs> they're, they're, it's- yeah. it, there's always been an informal approach to the pitching motion. You know, when you watch runners uh, in the Olympics and they're running, you're going to see the similar styles. Even when you watch great golfers, you're going to see similar styles. In most sports, you see something, a wide receiver running down the field. If you had 10 screens and saw 10 wide receivers running down the field after catching the ball, you're going to see running styles that look very similar because, uh, you know, there is a, just like when we look at cars, all the cars are driving down the street looking the same way, right? Because yes, there are a series of machines. Well, we are built that way too, but for some reason with pitching, uh, the guy, I can't remember the pitcher's name. He was a closer and, uh, he would throw the ball so hard and every pitch he would land on his hand, his left, he was a righty. He would land on his left hand on the mound. He would fall down. Yeah. 
And it, 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 seriously, this was like, I don't remember. I, I'll try to remember his name. I can't remember it. But this was his style. Every pitch. We're not talking a pitch where he lost his balance. What? It's like, how? so this kid's been doing that his whole life. Where was somebody who's like, that's not right. It's like <laughs> you're driving up on the sidewalk. Oh, I've always driven up on the sidewalk. No, the first second you're up on the sidewalk, you got to figure out why can't I stay on the street? There's something about pitching that has been so work product oriented, throw balls, don't throw balls, throw strikes, get the guy out, that there's been this like leisurely sort of lax way. And I think that's the message I want. I, I always want to bring. Let's respect our pitchers and let's help them be at their best. And I don't think that happens by critiquing them in a way that doesn't produce a solution. Plus, what if you did see something and you told the parent, what's the parent going to do with that? Try to change their own mechanics? That's my second thing. Parents, put away your video cameras. And second, please stop trying to fix his mechanics. Please bring him to a professional who teaches for a living. Not that you might not know what you're seeing, but let someone do it who does it for a living. And that, those are my two messages. And that way, everybody's respected. And I think that's really, really, to me, the real take home I, I would love from this segment. Yeah. And again, just to bring that uh, similarity up, if, if there's something wrong with your car, if you need an oil change or you need something done with it, you, you take it to the mechanic. You should do the same thing with your pitcher, Un unless you are a mechanic and can do it yourself. Bring your pitcher to someone who teaches pitching and ideally someone who teaches pitching and fully understands body movement, someone like Angel Borelli. So that's, uh, I think that's that's all we have for this episode. I think we've uh, covered quite a bit this time. Yes, and I hope uh, we've got everybody in the 2018 year and not 1978. Absolutely. So again, thank you for listening. This is uh, episode seven, season five of Baseball Pitching the Fix. If you want to learn more about Angel, you should go to her website, gymscience.com, G-Y-M-S-C-I-E-N-C-E.com. And we're going to have links to the uh, to the article from 1978. We're going to have a link to that first pitch strike warm up that Angel mentioned so that you can warm up your arms. And, and there's all kinds of other great things that you can find at Angel's website. We'll be back again in about two weeks. And in the meantime, I want to wish you safe and effective performance on the pitching mound.